What's up, y'all? I am just letting the message group know that uh, I'm live. Give everybody a chance to come on. Okay, now I've got a little icon that's showing my Wi-Fi connection, which is really interesting. So hopefully that gets stronger because it's looking like uh, it's low bars. Okay, so we're gonna start right at 2.30. So we're gonna give everybody a chance to come on. When you come on, let me know if you can see and hear me, okay? Because uh, I wanna be sure everything's coming through, okay? It's really funny because I'm shooting in high definition, but, but uh, I don't think it comes out on Facebook and high definition, that's the thing. My camera and my settings got me HD. Now I'm looking at it's crystal. But when I get it, it's not so. Now see, it just. Uh, So, all right, in one minute, because it's about one time. There's my sister. And then we're going. Yeah. So I just want to thank all of you that watch me live every week. Thank you for all of you that share the broadcast as many places as you can. And uh, so we're just going to keep on moving forward. So we can uh, get the word of the Lord out. Okay, it's 2.30, so we're going to start. Again, if you can see me and hear me, okay, let me know. If you can't see me or hear me, Okay, then please let me know. Okay. If you can't see me or hear me, okay, please let me know in the chat in the comments. Okay. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your prophetic word. We thank you for sending the Holy Ghost back to us, Jesus, so we wouldn't be orphans because we don't have any connection to you, Lord, without the Holy Ghost. We don't even know who you are. We wouldn't even have our eyes opened if it weren't for the Holy Ghost. So we thank you, Spirit of God, for being among us, in us, and dwelling us, sealing us and enlightening us. And we thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Ghost back. And we thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. And we just give you honor. We give you glory. And before we ask you anything, we just want to take a moment to praise you for what you've already done. And thank you. And right now, oh God, please fill me with the Holy Ghost. Uh, please forgive me any sin. Move that out the way. I must decrease so you can increase. Please speak through me, oh God, because it's your word that has life. It's your word that makes a difference. So let me say it, everything that you want to be said, not my will, but thine be done, so that you can be glorified in all things, so that the believers can be edified, so that hell can be terrified, and so that unbelievers can be challenged to believe in you and to turn from their way and turn to you. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right. Lisa says she can hear me just fine. Great. Okay. Today's live prophetic word is ancestor. Put that on the screen. Today's live prophetic word is ancestor. What's an ancestor? An ancestor is someone that has lived before you someone that is, you are their descendant, you are a part of their bloodline, you are a part of their family. 
<clears throat> okay, and that's the one that from I go to the scripture and we go on back. Shenanigans, always stuff happening. We're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to see what the Holy Ghost has to say to us today. We're going to read Deuteronomy 6 and 10. Deuteronomy 6 and 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, starting from the top. It's the fifth book of the Old Testament. It's the fifth book of Moses. The Hebrew people call that the Torah. Uh, Gentiles call that the Pentateuch, five books. Deuteronomy is the fifth book. And it's kind of Moses' farewell to the Hebrews, okay? So we're going to be reading out of... Yeah, I saw that. I had a quick fade out. I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> but we want this thing to stay connected for the whole thing. All right. So we're going to read out of Deuteronomy 6 and 10. Here goes. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you a land with great and splendid cities that you did not build. That's the Bring and Study Bible. Uh, New Living Translation, the Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. King James, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. Okay, we're going to look at a couple other verses, but I want to look at that in detail at first. And it says, and when the Lord your God, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is talking about believers, believers in the God of heaven. On the Old Testament, that was Jehovah, that was Yahweh, that was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But even under the Old Covenant, Gentiles could be grafted in if they believed in the God of the Hebrews. Under the New Testament, God revealed himself through Jesus Christ and said, whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God opened up the kingdom to everyone. The kingdom was always open to everyone, but he started it with the Hebrew people first. But with the revelation of Christ, it was whosoever believed. OK, so we understand in the New Testament that our connection to heaven is Jesus, everything that we're connected to that is divine is because of Jesus, okay? So when the Lord your God, why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. Because do you have a personal relationship? Do you have a personal relationship with God? Or do you have a mom and them went to this church or mom and them said this or blah, 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 and you've got that kind of relationship? Because that's not personal. That's a God that you heard of. OK, and that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what the scripture says. OK, the scripture is talking about the Lord. Your God is a personal. Then it goes on to say, when the Lord, your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers. Now, wait just a minute. So let me deal with something that has been a part of African-American culture for a very long time. I don't know if younger people now still believe it or think that way. I don't know if they think that way or believe it or not. But when I was a kid, they used to talk about Canaan and the promised land synonymously with heaven. That's because many of the songs written during slavery were looking up to see a brighter day. And they were talking about the day when they got released from this life and went into the glory realm. That's not what the scripture is talking about. That's where we get it from in African-American culture from slavery. But that's not actually what the Bible is talking about. The Bible is talking about a land in this life that God is trying to bring you into, a land of abundance, a land of more than enough, a land of purpose where you're doing what you were born to do, a land of plentiful resources, a land where there are giants on it, but you conquer them through him and through faith, through obedience to what he tells you to do. That's talking about now in the life. I'm amazed to this day how many Christians argue about that, how many Christians think that this life is all about, you know, suffering and a whole bunch of stuff. 
Yeah, you're going to suffer because we live in an evil world, but you're supposed to overcome. That's what the Lord said. In this world, you shall have trials and tribulations, but be good here. I have overcome the world. Okay? The, the straight out the Lord's mouth. See, so you're supposed to come into a place where you have more than enough. You're supposed to come into a place where you're living your purpose. You're supposed to come into a place where you are the aggressor. You are slaying giants and getting them off your land. You're supposed to come to that point in your life. And that's what God promised. Poor father, you're going to say stuck. That's why you heard me do many prophetic teachings on letting the old man go, letting the old man die, letting the old life go. Because you're going to come into situations where you're going to need to move forward and you can't do that if you're hanging on to the old life. And Christians just never make that transition. They spend the rest of their lives mistakes made in their past, and that's not blood. Jesus. That's why his death was so brutal, so they could punishment for you. You no longer had to carry them. That's why he carried them for you. Okay. So <clears throat> to make this even more personal, see, there are some promises in your family. That's why you're supposed to know who and what you come from. There are some things God promised your mother, your father, your mother on sides, your grandfather on both sides, your great grands on both sides. There are some things that God promised them. Sometimes in their generation, they realize them and sometimes don't. What that means that God has at least come to family, then you're still the family that brings that into your family. You're supposed to carry forward what they did and fully realize the potential of what God comes to your heart. See that? So it's not just you. It's not just your life. It's the life of all those that have gone on before you and the life of all those that will come after you. Let's continue with the scripture. It says, he's to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He named them. He named them because God had a relationship with Abraham. God had a relationship with Isaac. God had a relationship with Jacob. He had all personal experiences with him. Abraham, Isaac, experienced you and now. So you can make that better. Okay. Let me know if that's better. So you have a personal relationship with God, and they had a personal relationship with God, and they had promises. Okay, promise out one way or the other. Okay, so uh, seem like every time I come on, there's some some internet stuff. Uh, so um, anyway, so you're supposed to move forward with those promises that your four parents got, and you're supposed to realize them, and you're supposed to pass them on to your children. But the scripture names the patriarchs by name. So if you come from a godly family, somebody had any kind of relationship with Jesus at all, the Lord knows them by name, by name, okay? Because remember, I keep telling you this is personal. That's a land with great and splendid cities that you did not visit. So I look at some resources, there's some blessings, there's some stuff out there that you're gonna <clears throat> inherit some stuff you're gonna get that you didn't build because there's gonna be some giants on it that you're gonna slay, that you're gonna move out of your way. Okay?
Now look at scripture Jeremiah 11, 5. New Living Translation. I said this so I could keep my promise to your ancestors to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you live in today. Then I replied, amen, Lord, may it be so. Okay. King James Bible, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, so be it, O Lord. Okay. Is, uh, I need y'all to pray for my internet connection because everybody keeps telling me. Keep... I'm trying to, yeah, connections in and out. Huh. And I know when this happens to a lot of people have been talking about it. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on. It's just the enemy keep getting this word out. Screen is free a lot, yeah. Yeah, so all right, so y'all pray for me so we can get this connection together so I can finish getting this word out. Okay, so Jeremiah 11 and five. So the Lord says um, it was in order to establish or to confirm or to keep my promise, to keep an oath I swore to your forefathers. Now that's a different level. The Lord swore that he would do this. The Lord swore that he would do this. The Lord swore that he would do this. Don't you understand? Or if you're the first one in your family, if you're the first one in your family to uh, uh, receive those promises, you understand that this is God swearing an oath. What that means is that that blessing has now become attached to your bloodline. It has now become attached, realize it. It is not going to lift off your bloodline, but it's for the next generation. Why would you miss your destiny? Why would you miss your generation? Why would you miss the things that you need to do? Okay, because God put it on your family. So you know what that means? I'm gonna tell you what that means. I'm gonna tell you how we're supposed to apply that today. It means you're supposed to have the mentality of a blessed person. You're supposed to have the mentality of knowing that you are carrying a blessing and that you yourself are a blessing and that everything that you do is blessed. Why do you think the devil works so hard to mess up our self-esteem? Because the devil wants you to feel bad about yourself. Because the devil wants you to think bad about yourself. Only to not ask who it is that you are and what it is that you're carrying. That happened to a lot of people in the Bible. That happened to Jacob. You hear me say that all the time, that Jacob did not get who he was. Moses did not get who he was way later in the game. He was 80 years old. Everything that Moses did that famous for, excluding the Egyptian. Everything that Moses did he famous for happened between the ages of 80 and 120. So I'll stop by to tell you, even if you feel that you're older now, it's not too late. It's not too late to pick up your mantle. It's not too late to pick up your family's promises. It's not too late to pick up the blessing that's on your bloodline. But if your relatives are still alive, you can ask them what their dreams were and what they were supposed to do, what they may or may not have gotten to. I'll give you a personal example. One of the things my father told me when I was still very young, when my dad was alive, was that one of the things he always wanted to do that he regretted not doing was he wanted
to learn to play the piano. My family's back in the day, he never learned how to play the piano. So my father said that's one thing he regretted. Well, I play the piano, okay? And I've been playing the piano since I was a teenager, okay? So that was something I picked up that I've been able to carry forward from my dad, something my dad didn't get to in his life. But I picked it up and I've been carrying it forward. That's an example of what I mean. You see that? And so you're supposed to to the next generation. Okay, the screen's back. I'll keep going in there. Okay, so here's the challenge. Here's the challenge for today when we read those scriptures. All right, let me read one, one more scripture and I'll give you the manner because I got another scripture. Last scripture I want to read is 2 Kings 2, 13 through 14. 2 Kings 2, 13 through 14. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took is the Lord. The God. question there is your mentor. Who is your mentor in the spirit? Who is the one that birthed you into the kingdom? Who is the one that raised you into the kingdom? Who is the one that imparted into you in the kingdom? Who is the one that helped you grow spiritually in the kingdom? Because whoever that person is, because you don't have a lot of people like that in your life, but whoever that person's or persons are, you're carrying an impartation. Elijah let his cloak fall to the ground, and Elisha picked it up. And Elisha asked for a double portion. So Elisha ended up doing twice the miracles of Elijah. So who is the person that mentored you in the spirit? Who is the person or the persons that taught you Christ? Because that's not a lot of people. You may have heard a lot of sermons, but there's somebody that came in your life that got in the trenches with you that got their hands dirty, that stayed with you through ups and downs, thick and thin. Who is that person for you? Okay. I'm not talking about somebody where you listen to a sermon a couple of times. I'm not talking about somebody you met or somebody that prophesied to you one time. I'm talking about somebody that was in your life for years. Somebody that poured into you, somebody that helped develop you as a believer. Who was that person or persons? You carry their impartation. You carry their mantle. I can think of my fathers in the spirit right now, the men that poured into my life, the men that introduced me to Christ and the men that introduced me to so many things, the men that absolutely changed my life for the better in the spirit, in the kingdom. I know exactly who those men are. Okay. See what I carry their impartation with me, in me. And I've been doing my best and want to continue to do my best to pass it on. Who are those people for you? Because that's the mantle that you got. That's why you got to be careful who you hang around. And that's why you got to be careful who you sit under. Because you're going to get an impartation. Okay? Because that's just the way it works. Haven't you ever noticed when you start hanging out with somebody, you start using their catchphrases? You ever notice that? You start using their personal slang. You ever notice that? That's impartation. You start saying what they say. Okay. And so who is who is those people for you? So here's my challenge. Let me read the scripture again. Because I was about to issue the challenge. Here's the challenge. Okay, let me read the scripture again. Going back to Jeremiah 11 and 5. This was in order to establish the oath I swore to your forefathers 
to give them a life flowing with milk and honey as it is to Here's my challenge. Milk and honey. Our purpose. Are we walking in the resources we need? Are we walking in the relationships that we need? Are, are we, you know, that question, are we there yet? Okay. Why am I issuing that challenge? Why is that a big deal? I'll tell you why. Because you don't want to leave any promise of God unrealized in your life. Now I'm preparing a whole series of teaching on marriage because the Lord has given me so much revelation. The Lord has just given me a ton of revelation and I'm preparing some teaching and I'm gonna release at some point. But let me just throw this little bit out. Don't you know that the first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person? I'm gonna say that one more time. <laughs> the first promise in the entire Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person. Did you know that? Why do you think you keep hearing me say that all that stuff we were doing in our religious institutions, God clearly wasn't pleased with because he tore it down. He took his mighty hand in 2020 and he smote the globe. He smote the planet and all that religious stuff that we were doing, the Lord tore it down. You know why? Because how much of that were, were we pursuing what the Bible actually says? And how much of that were we pursuing religious traditions and traditions of men and things that people think are important? How are you gonna sit up there and make it your business to talk about who ain't saved and this one ain't saved and this one ain't right, or argue about eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end time doctrines. In other words, how the world is going to end, because people argue about the rapture. People argue about something called the millennial reign, whether or not Jesus is actually coming back to earth and he's going to reign for a thousand years on earth, whether or not that's literally true or whether or not that's metaphor or allegory, whether or not it's already happened. People argue about whether or not there's a hell but I haven't heard anybody talk about the first promise in the Bible. And the first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person. The first promise is God made humans. Did you know that? How long have you been going to hear anybody say that? They told you things like, don't be a bench warmer. <laughs> they told you things like, don't be a pew member. Because instead of doing the work of the church, they got you involved in church work. Church work has to do with a whole bunch of business work to facility running, keep all that going, whatever. But the work of the church is to build you up in Christ. The work of the church is for you to know God for yourself. That means knowing God on every level there is to know him. That means... Knowing his written word, the Bible, for fresh word, because the prophetic word will always and the prophetic word will always line up with Jesus. The Bible's a written word, Jesus' prophetic word is not going to contradict the mother two. And if you went to church before for two, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if you've been going to church since you were a child. How many times did you hear somebody say that the first promise in the Bible was that you don't have to be married to the wrong person? No prophet tell that you wrong because the first promise in the Bible was when the Lord promised that he would take the seed of the woman and he would crush the serpent and then, eh, incorrect. That's not the first one. The first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to spend your life married to the wrong person. Now, let me ask you something. How many of us come from divorced homes? How many of us know people that come from divorced homes? How many of us have had to struggle in our upbringing because 
our father wasn't there or our mom wasn't there. Or maybe we didn't know our mom or maybe we didn't know our dad or maybe they died early or maybe they just didn't want to have anything to do with us. How many, how many of us had to struggle for identity because your father wasn't around or because your mother wasn't around or because your father or your mother or your aunties or your grandparents said things to you that just weren't who you were. They weren't in line with who you were or who you were supposed to be, but they got that stuff in your head. And then you had to spend some years getting those wrong ideas out of your head. How many things like that? Uh-huh. And the Lord says in Malachi that he wants the hearts of the fathers to turn towards their children. And he wants the hearts of the children to turn towards their fathers, lest he come and smite the earth with a curse. What happened in 2020? Earth got smitten with a curse. That means that God was not pleased with the relationship between fathers and children and children and fathers, just like he said. So don't you think it makes more sense <laughs> if God... God said something is first to put first what God put first. And I'm going to ask you one more time. In all your years of going to church, how many times did you hear somebody say that the first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person? I know some of y'all out there, I know some of y'all, some of y'all don't go and watch on the replay, and I know however many people watch this broadcast, I know you squirming when I say that. And the reason you squirming when I say that is because some of y'all are very much with the wrong person. Some of y'all don't have a relationship and you want one, and you're wondering how to get one, or you're wondering how did I miss? And some of y'all are very much with the wrong person. So how can you say that you're getting in your personal promised land if your core relationship with your spouse, if that ain't what it's supposed to be? Your first relationship is your relationship with God. Your second relationship is your relationship with yourself. But if you get married, you have become one flesh with somebody else. So... Don't we think that relationship is supposed to be right? Isn't that a part of promised land living? Isn't that a part of abundance? It's not about buildings and vineyards and olive trees. Okay, there we go. Y'all keep praying out in this internet, but the devil is alive. Because I've noticed whenever I teach like on family stuff, just all kind of weird stuff happening because the devil doesn't want us to get down to family stuff. You see that? That's the first promise in the Bible. And <clears throat> another thing I'll throw out to you, I'll say this. I would almost guarantee that you have heard sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon about sexual sin. I want you to think about all the sermons you've heard in your life about fornication, adultery, pornography, what King David did with Bathsheba. Think back, if you've been in church any length of time, I want you to think about all the times you heard a sermon about sexual sin, about don't fornicate, which we're not supposed to, about don't commit adultery, which you're not supposed to. That's right, that's biblical. And using King David as an example and all that. In pornography, pornography is everywhere now. We're not supposed to watch porn as believers. You say, that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Right. So uh, I want you to think about how many times in the course of your church life, you heard somebody preach against sexual sin. Then I want you to contrast that. How many times did you hear somebody talk about Finding the right, think about how many sermons you've heard talking about the evils of sexual sin, which is right, that sexual sin is wrong. I want you to think about how many sermons you've heard preaching against sexual sin. And then I want you to think about how many sermons you've heard preaching for finding the right person and having a healthy sex life inside of your marriage. 
So if you're a Christian and you're living holy, you're living celibate, but you have a desire, you have a desire to be married, you have desire, uh, you have natural desire to have sex, you have a desire to have a celibate, that can get really frustrating. I want you to think about how many times you've heard somebody talk about what you shouldn't do, how you shouldn't be fornicating, which is right. You shouldn't be living in adultery, which is absolutely right. You should not be going with another man, husband or wife, or you, not, you should not be cheating on your spouse. How many times you heard him talk about that? How many times you heard him talk about how you shouldn't watch porn, which you shouldn't? Oh, that's correct. But I want you to think about the number of times you heard a message like that versus the number of times you heard somebody talk about how to find the right person how to get married and stay married, how to find somebody to be with, how to have a self healthy sex life instead uh, uh, inside of your marriage instead of living a frustrated life as a Christian where you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're living holy and celibate, you're just frustrated because you have a natural desire to have sex with someone. How many times, I want you to compare and contrast, remember the old math problems in school that we hated? Well, not everybody hated him, but I never liked math. But anyway, think about it. Think about it. The first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person. How many of y'all knew that? How many years you've been going to church? This one I'm trying to tell you. This one I'm trying to tell you. If we're going to take the promised land, it's not just money, that's a part of it. It's not just property and buildings and land. That's definitely part of it. It's not just health and healing. That's a part of it. But what we want to do is we want to take the whole thing. And I have discovered that we have built up a whole lot of doctrine, which is not incorrect. But we have not put first things first. There's a reason we have a numerical system. There's a reason there's such a thing as numbers, because numbers always have to do with order, some kind of order, as well as math, you know, different type of math configurations. But when we want to order something, we use some type of numbering. We put things in order. And when God tells us about his kingdom, he said to seek it first. When they asked the Lord, what is the greatest commandment? He said the greatest, the first commandment, greatest commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And I just talked to you about the first promise in the Bible. I'm going to challenge you again. How many years did you go to church and hear about first things first? How many sermons have you heard about first? You see that? Now can you see? Why all that religious stuff we were doing was torn down, we have a historic opportunity here to build according to the scriptures. That's why God gave us a Bible, so we would know his word, so we would know his commandments, and so we could know what he thinks. And if you came from a divorced home, if you come from a family that's full of divorce, if you come from a family where the people seem like <clears throat> they were constantly, constantly uh, hooking up with the wrong people. It's time for you to break that curse. So I don't want you to think just money. I don't want you to think just property and houses and land and, and you know, milk and honey. It's supposed to be that because that's what the scripture says. But the, the first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person. I'm going to ask you again. Did you know that? How many years did you go to church? Did anybody ever say that in your hearing? That the first promise God ever made to humans is that you had to be married to the wrong person. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know that's rough. And that's exactly my point. We have built up a whole church culture around things that is not what God said is first. God said the first commandment was to love him with all that we have. 
And then the Bible says in 1 John 4 that we can't love him until we first let him love us. We love him because he, he first is our word again. That means the very first thing you have to do as a Christian is you have to learn how to let God love you. Is that what they taught you in church? Or did they teach you, don't be a bench warmer, don't be a pew member, get busy, get involved, get on a team. Is that what they taught you? Or did they teach you, now that you're saved, the first thing you're supposed to do is sit down and learn how to let God love you. Learn what that means. What does it mean? What is God's love? What is his love like? How do you know it? How do you feel it? How can you tell when it's him? How do I let my new father, see, because I just got saved, so I got free from my old daddy. My old daddy was a devil. Now I got a new daddy, a father of God, and I got a new elder brother, Jesus Christ, and I got a new source of power. So before, I might be powered of flesh or powered by, or by several of them, and now that I'm saved, I'm supposed to be powered by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God. How do I let them love me? What does that mean? So the first thing we got to do when we get saved is learn how to let God love you. As you learn how to let God love you, then you fall in love with him. He said, that's the first and the great commandment. Is that what they taught you in church? Did they have you memorizing scripture and getting on teams and driving a church van and cooking chicken and, and doing all this other stuff and Easter parade, big hats and and putting money in the building fund. And I'm not saying any of that's wrong. I'm asking you, however many years you went to church, did anybody ever talk to you about the first things? So if we're going to take the promised land, we're going to have to get down to brass tacks and do what the scripture says and stop doing what religion taught us. And the scripture is the first thing you're supposed to do is learn how to let God love you because you can't love him until you first know his love for you. After you know his love for you, then you're supposed to love him with all that you have. That's the priority because that's what he said. Then he said the second is to love yourself. How much have you heard that in church? What you always heard in church was love others. Uh huh. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, not love your neighbor instead of yourself. How many of us are struggling with health care issues? How many of us are struggling with financial issues? How many of us are struggling with a whole bunch of things because we haven't properly learned to love ourselves? Because you will, you will traverse heaven and earth for somebody else, but you wouldn't put that same effort into your own life and your own self. Why? Do you think other people are more important to you? They're not more important. They're not less important. They're as important but you're important too. Like if you're the kind of person that would forgive somebody else in a heartbeat, but you beat upon yourself for years, then you're not loving you right. God said, first, you love me. Second, you love you. How many times did you hear that in church? See that? Now you see all these firsts I'm bringing you? I'm bringing you these firsts from scripture. Scripture, how in the world can we fulfill the calling of our ancestors and how in the world can we take the promised land and how in the world can we become all that we're supposed to be if we ain't doing none of what God said was first, if we married to the wrong people, if we haven't ever learned to let God love us, if we don't love him with all that we have, if we don't love ourselves. Uh, tithing, if you know anything about tithing, Tithing is about the first fruits. Tithing is about taking 10% of every dollar you get, a dime out of every dollar, and bringing it and giving it to the house of God. You're not supposed to offer God anything off the bottom. So if you've been doing stuff like that, that's incorrect. Okay? You have to offer God 10% off the top. God gets his off the top, always. Okay? So you probably heard more sermons about that. You've probably heard about that. You've probably heard more sermons about 
tithing and offering, giving money, and preaching against sexual sin than you have anything else if you spend any amount of time in church. But I'm going to ask you one more time. How many times have you ever heard somebody say that the first promise in the Bible is that you didn't have to be married to the wrong person? How many times have you heard that? Just think about it. Just think about it. This is what I'm trying to tell you. And sometimes in these situations, these are the places that our ancestors dropped the ball. Mama hooked up with the wrong person. Dad hooked up with the wrong person. Uh, divorce ran in the family. A strong family unit was not established because either nobody told you that you don't have to be married to the wrong person or they told you and you didn't believe them. You just rejected it. And you decided that you could pick somebody better than God. That will not happen in a million years of living. Could you ever pick someone to be married to better than one that invented people? You see that? So we're going to have to, I know it was rough, it's not music back then. We're going to have to throw out our risk notions. We're going to have to throw out our religious traditions. We're going to have to throw out all the stuff that we thought was important. And we're going to have to do what the scripture actually says. And I will challenge you one more time to ask you, how many times do you hear that in church? How many times did you hear that your first job was to let God love you? How many times did you hear that the first thing you're supposed to do after letting God love you is love him back? And then after you know his love and after you begin to love him, that you're supposed to love you. How many times have you heard that the first promise in the Bible is that you're going to be married to the wrong person? He relationships very early in life, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age. We started having relationships very early. Did you get this information that early? Did anybody ever tell you that if you are slotted for marriage, that there's someone in particular that God wants you to marry? And that's the first promise in the Bible, which means that investing in people that you're not supposed to be with that's why it causes so much pain. Not that you won't have pain when you get the right person, because you will. But just think about the relationships you've had where you've invested so much of your heart, so much of your body, so much of your time, so much of your money. You can make more money, but you can't get heart, body, and time back. Once that is spent, area spent. What if somebody told you very early in your life that the first thing God promised you was the right spouse? How would that impact you psychologically if somebody told you that when you were 10 years old? If somebody told you your 10 year old self in fifth grade, God has the right spouse for you. So your job in these next years to get ready for that person. You waste time people that ain't some when they come around because you don't want to be somewhere off with somebody else and then you miss your person when they come around. You want to be ready for your person. Uh, what if somebody they told you? you that? Do you think y'all would now tell you that when you were 10, 11, 12? See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Do you see the difference between religion? See what religion has done to us? Religion has pulled us away from the Bible. <laughs> it's not funny. That's not funny. That's pathetic and it's pitiful. But hopefully that helps you understand why all that religious stuff got torn down by the mighty hand of God. Because Are we doing what the scripture says? Do you love the Lord now? Have you been sitting under somebody's ministry? Do you love the Lord now more than you did when you started listening to him? Do you love yourself more? Okay. And are you with your person? Why do I keep harping on that? And why is that so important? I'm going to say this a little bit, then I'm going to be through. I'll tell you why. Because let me tell you how you're going to end up. You're going to end up receiving rewards for like your career accomplishments or, or other accomplishments you might have in your life, academic or financial, or you know, you're gonna do these things. And when you stand up there on the platform 
for them to give you that award. You're going to have to a fake smile on your face because your home life is so miserable. That is not promised land living. <laughs> That's not promised land living. How are you going to get reward? See, because we care about money, cars, cars and houses and property and what people think of us and how things look. And But how come we're not caring about business first? When people speak of you, what do they say of you? Do they say, you know, one thing I know about that person, they show sure love the Lord. Is that your testimony? Is that what people know about you? That you love Jesus so much it just bubbles up off you that you can't help it? They know that you love the Lord. They know that when I talk about this person, well, I know they love the Lord. Is that is that what people think of us? Because the Lord said, that's the first thing we're supposed to be doing is loving him with all that we have. Is that how somebody would describe you if they know you? And, and uh, same thing with your home life situation. If you're not with the right person, or if you're by yourself and you don't want to be, did you miss someone in your past? Did you meet the right person and you missed them? That kind of thing. What do you do if you did? Anybody ever teach you stuff like that? Anybody ever say anything like that in your hearing in church? Or did they focus on sexual sin? Did they focus on pornography, fornication, adultery? Did they focus on that? Did they focus on telling you what not to do? Or did anybody ever tell you what to do? See, because we're going to have to stop this phony taking out of promised land and take the promised land for real, where we're actually happy, where we're actually prosperous, where we actually look in the areas of life. Now, I'm not talking about perfection, Nobody's where we have the being of God in every area. And and somebody needs to get this in our head very early in life because that's when we start making relationship decisions. I mean, unless you have parents that were extraordinarily good with money, if your parents were extraordinarily good with money, they started you off with an allowance or a bank account or they started teaching you very, very early because some parents do do that for their children because I know some parents like that. But the one thing that we all have in common, whether or not you had parents that were good with money or not, is that you started liking people. Think about it. Everybody had that summer where everybody was out there playing softball and everybody's running around, boys and girls are like, when that big of a deal. And we all had that summer where we went and we back to school and all of a sudden everybody looked different. <laughs> and all of a sudden people got really cute all of a sudden. We all have that in common, that we started thinking about relationships very early in our lives. And then some of us had damaged relationships. Some of us had to deal with things like rape and and molestation and other people coming in your life doing things to you sexually they shouldn't have been doing to no child. For some of us, that was our introduction to relationships and sexuality. That kind of stuff can scar you for life and you need healing. All this stuff happened in when not you were with whether or not they taught you about money. We all started liking people. Okay, so did anybody in church ever teach you the first promise in the Bible. I'm going to ask you that yet one more time. See, so that's why we got to put the religion down. We got to put the traditions down because I'm not one. I'm not talking about other people. I'm not one to argue about who's saved and who's not because the scripture there, find the Lord and is sure having seen the Lord knows it is. People tell me that Jesus who's None business anyway. I need to be sure I'm living right. I need to, I need to work on my own soul salvation. So I'm too worried about who who really. Stopped. I never have understood that. But I'm not talking about anybody. I'm talking about me. That's not a priority for me. I don't understand it. I've never understood it. I don't even understand. It. I don't get it. Somebody don't have to be saved for you. Have you ever read the Bible? Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Solomon was a massive fornicator. So was Samson. Samuel was a national prophet, but he didn't raise his sons to fear God. Uh, Elisha was a mighty man of miracles, but he had an attitude. 
Elijah seriously was sarcastic and had an attitude. Uh, Peter was impulsive, you know, the cussing fishermen, on and on and on. These were real people. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was controlling. Uh, Job's wife, when the chips got down, said, you ought to curse God and die. I mean, these are real people. These are not super saints. These are not super people. These are real people with real lives. Have you read the Bible? So all this phony kind of stuff. It's stuff we're going to have to throw out. And we're going to have to start getting down. Take the problem. Uh, screen, okay. If we're going to correct the mistakes of our answers, and if we're going to inherit our answers, and if we're going to establish new functions, your view can grow up, that can grow. The only way to do that is to get down to what the scripture actually says and throw away all of our religious traditions. There is no other way. The only way to succeed is to do what God said, the way God did, when God said do it. There is no other way for maximum success. You got to do what the Lord said. You got to do it when the Lord says do it. And you got to do how God say do it. There is no other way. And so I don't care how radical I sound, I will stand by my black prophetic self. That's right. I said I'll stand by my black prophetic self and I will stand on the word of God by myself. Because the first promise in the Bible is that you don't have to be married to the wrong person. So how are we going to spend all of our time talking about ca uh, cars and houses and money and airplanes and being famous and blowing up all this kind of stuff? But we don't talk about getting the first thing got talked about right. Our relationship with him, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with our spouses. How are we just going to skip over all that? See, you're going to be standing somewhere, getting an award with a phony smile on your face because you ain't really happy. Because you don't really love the Lord and you don't really love yourself and you might be with the wrong person. All that's in the Bible. You just ain't heard it in church. Okay? And that's how we're going to get the mantle of our ancestors right. That's how we're going to correct the stuff that they missed. That's how we're going to actually take the life that God was just down. Every area, not just some areas. That's why I don't argue with people about healing, because healing is in the scripture. I don't care what you say. I've been divinely healed. My son's been divinely healed. Too many people I know. I've seen it since I was a child. God heals. God heals through medicine. God heals through food. God heals through faith, Holy Ghost. But healing, your body is built for healing. You got white blood cells that are designed to fight off disease and antibiotics, anything in your bloodstream that doesn't blow off. So God built healing into your blood. How are you going to say healing ain't real? That's why I don't listen to crazy people. <laughs> Healing's in the script of life. That's why I don't care what people say. I will stand by my black prophetic on the scripture. I don't care who don't like it. So if we're going to take the promised land and fix the mistakes of our ancestors, we're going to have to get down to what the words say. And we're going to have to stop doing what we think. We're going to have to stop doing tradition. We're going to have to stop that. That's the only way. All right. Amen. Amen. That's the live prophetic word. Uh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Prophetic word coming from the Holy Ghost. For behold, my people, it is time for you to listen to me. I want you to develop your personal relationship with me. I want you to know my voice. I want you to know my word. For that is my desire, as I have spoken in the scripture, that all of you know me from the least to the greatest. For I am indeed the Lord your God. I want to love you intimately. I want you to know me intimately. And I want to share the victory I died to give you on every level of your life. It says, fear of living God. Amen and amen. Wow.
He had the Holy Ghost at every level. The Holy Ghost said intimate relationship with Christ. You hear that? Okay, if you got a prayer request, put it on the screen. If anything you want me to pray for, I know broadcast has been been bouncing in and out all thing but you know uh whenever i'm talking about something revolutionary or regular whenever i'm talking about family stuff or whether i'm talking about something that will break you free from religion and tradition and the lies of the devil look like the internet just started acting up have you ever noticed that whenever we're talking about any type of deliverance deliverance from bad teaching, deliverance from bad traditions, deliverance from, from hurts and pains we've been carrying. Some of us have been carrying hurts and pains since we were little. And that's why you've never been able to get your relationships right. You got hurt when you were a child and you've been looking for somebody to fix that. That's not what romantic relationships do. Romantic relationships don't fix what's wrong with you. If you want somebody to fix what's wrong with you, you have to go to Jesus. Jesus invented you. Jesus knit you together in your mother's womb. Jesus died for you. Jesus redeemed you. And then Jesus sent back the Holy Spirit to indwell you. So you actually have to go to the manufacturer if you want to be fixed. You can't do that in a romantic relationship. That's not what they're for. Now, can you, can you think about right now Think about how much time in your life you wasted trying to have a romantic relationship that you thought was going to fix you. It didn't work out, did it? That only comes from Christ. Do you see why we have to go in order? You see why we have to take this first? See why we have to throw out all the religion and tradition and do what the scripture actually say? Can you see it? Think about the years you could have saved if you had known, if you had known to stop wasting your time trying to find somebody to fix you and turn to Jesus, the one that built you. See that? All right, that's it for this week. Praise God, amen. For those of you, uh, if you came on late, go back to the beginning and watch this from the beginning. Those of you that are watching the replay, watch it all the way through. I know there's dropouts. I know there's brownouts and blackouts, but they're telling me the audio still came through so you can still hear it. So hear the word of God and believe because it's, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. All the old religious stuff has been torn down. Okay, we have nothing new according to the scripture. All right, amen, God bless. Uh, this is, uh, okay, we got one. So next week, Sunday is last day in February. Next Sunday is actually the 28th. So I will be back next Sunday. 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And y'all pray about my internet. I need to get some new internet going so we, it can be more stable. So y'all pray about that for me. Uh, if you want to bless me, if I, uh, you know, please tell you know, me. That's what I'm going to tell you. This is a great uh, sunny. I don't know if you're name I want to get. <laughs> it was a story breaking the line that Cash App was allegedly, Cash App was allegedly stealing money. So I want you to look that up. That's why I'm so glad I switched to Zelle. Because if we're using They're, they're taking our money and whatnot. Uh, God bless.